when he walked through the door, I knew exactly who he was. <laughs> Absolutely no <coughs> doubt about that. We hadn't uttered a word, but I knew. And then a few years later, um, Sarah applied to, to, uh, to meet me. And that process was a little different, but nonetheless, it, it was just as exciting for both of us. Now, the question that we always get asked is what sort of relationship have we established? And it's really uh, something that you have to, that there's, there's no blueprint, there's no manual for this. You have to work out what the relationship's going to be. That is, if you want to maintain and keep the contact going. And in our case, we, we all wanted to. In fact, um, the, the, the two of them, Riley and Sarah, both wanted to meet each other. And they were delighted to do that. And, uh, so much so that they went off and travelled around Europe together. <laughs> so it's been a tremendously positive um, reaction. The relationship we have is, is one of great friendship. Riley says I'm not his dad. I'd, I've never asked him to clean up his room or for him to do his homework. That, that his dad is the person that's done that. And he c just calls me a good mate. And the relationship we have is ongoing. Uh, although both of them are overseas at the moment, we see each other regularly and we keep in contact regularly. And the, 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 the entire process of the way we met has been very, very positive. It's a story that I share with all my friends. I have their photographs on my phone and I talk about it openly and willingly. And I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this tonight, to, 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 to share the positive aspects of, of, of donor linking and, and the possibilities that might uh, come along if, if this sort of experience comes your way. Hi, um, so my name is Jackie and I have a partner, Sarah, and we have three children who are now um, 9, 11 and 13. Um, all of whom have the same donor. And uh, we met our donor very early on in the piece, uh, David, Donor Dave, as he is called in our house. And um, after we had Corinne, our son, who was uh, first, we wanted to have a second child, and uh, a, a friend of ours <laughs> referred to it as, uh, referred to Corinne as, um, as our having high product satisfaction um, with, with Donor Dave, which, which we, you know, <laughs> which was kind of funny at the time. So we approached the clinic to see if we could uh, also use David's sperm uh, for the second child um, and what happened was he had gone overseas and so we had a bit of toing and froing with the counsellor um, and I think uh, Jenny who was the counsellor at Melbourne IVF at the time kind of knew us quite well uh, she knew David quite well and one day we just got this email from Jenny saying look guys do you want to have each other's email and you can talk to each other directly um, so that was the initial contact, so that was kind of freaky. So I remember literally sitting down at the computer with Sarah and going, okay, we've got this email, what do you want to say? Um, and we started with, thank you. So, you know, very first email and we've still got the copies, you know, dear David, we just want to say thank you. Um, and we told him about Corinne, and that started a really um, a kind of fairly intense exchange of emails, and I thought that was interesting, that was our, certainly our experience. Um, and uh, then, uh, I'm trying to kind of keep it very short, so we um, ended up using him for, our, for the next two, for the two girls. Um, and we have uh, subsequently had contact with him. So he was overseas, he came to visit us when the kids were very little and we have had a number of visits since he lives in Perth. Um, it has been an extremely positive uh, relationship and journey throughout. Uh, David was very, very clear about why he donated um, and that's been really good. He talks about the fact that, um, you know, we're, his, we're the kids' parents, um, he doesn't see himself in that role at all um, and um, he, he does, it, it's interesting, he, he likes to know that um, the kids are doing well um, and the kids are loved and cared for and are thriving and he knows that, so that, that's great. Um, and I think, I mean, the odd thing was last time we saw him, I did get a friend's request on Facebook, which was kind of freaky. Um, but I said yes, and, and Corin, who's now 13, also hooked up with him recently. And in fact, just as I was leaving today, he said, oh, did you read David's funny story on Facebook? 
So I said, well, actually, I did. And you know, so we had this kind of conversation about that. Um, so that's all. It, it feels very good. It feels very safe. It feels that the kids know who he is. There's no myths. Um, we have also hooked up with uh, another family, two other families actually, who uh, for whom David is the donor. And uh, one family who's a, a rainbow family, a lesbian who has two kids. We now have a very close and ongoing relationship with them. We knew them beforehand. Um, uh, they're coming over on Saturday because it's uh, the kids' birthdays. Um, and that's also been really good. We also have, we also know of one other uh, single mum and a daughter who we also linked up with recently, um, who we, it, that was very, again, a very positive experience, but whom we probably will not, you know, have a kind of close friendship with. Again, it's kind of who you like. My name's Kerry. I'm the parent of two uh, beautiful daughters, uh, an eight-year-old and a 12-year-old. I'm a one-parent family. Um, we have, um, it's actually really quite bizarre for me to be talking about donor linking because we linked with the first family about 10 years ago and we linked with our donor about eight years ago. So to be standing up the front talking about it as something new and special is a bit bizarre for us because it's just part of our everyday life now. So we're well past that honeymoon period and, you know, the, the kind of uneasy start that some people often feel like but we're linked with um, three other families who use the same donor and we're linked with our donor. Um, we've had nothing but a wonderful experience and it's it, it has been for us everything that you've seen on the whiteboard it's been that kind of nervous anticipation beginning and people you know being on their best behavior and no one wanting to offend anyone but our journey now has grown to the point where yeah, and, and look it's at varying stages we, we met another family at Christmas so we're on a very early part of the journey with with just that one family, but with our donor and the other donor, the other the other kids from the donor conceived families, because we've linked so long, we do really cool things now. We holiday, we've been holidays with the donor um, and his ch one of his children, um, one of the other families, and I have travelled overseas with our kids together, um, and it's something that we do quite naturally. Um, you know, school holidays are a really good example. We all live in Melbourne, so we all tend to have each other's kids, and you know, you can come to my house on any day, and you know, there's eight kids there, and half of them and my children's half brothers and sisters so um but and it's really is just a, a they're, they're just like a natural extension of our family so it's been a really really wonderful experience for us hello um oh, i'm suddenly very loud i'm michael uh i found out i was donor conceived when i was 28 i was conceived in 74 back when you didn't tell and um it was a very difficult thing to find out and made was very unsettling and wanting to find out something about my donor was part of trying to turn something um, misfortunate into something positive. And when I, I actually discovered Vata and Kate, I was working in Melbourne and went along to a few of the donor support groups and met other donor conceived people, which is the first time that it happened and that was really neat. And I remember thinking it was very unlikely I'd meet my donor because in Adelaide and in South Australia, it's the dark ages in terms of um, like records were destroyed and it's even now legally, I think it's, it, it's really flailing behind. Um, but by ch because I was part of a documentary that aired in August last year on the ABC about donor conception, doing that and having my mug on the advertiser, my donor saw it. And lucky for me, he'd always been very open with his family. I think that's something that often must really be a big block, is if you haven't told your partner or your kids, then that's tricky. But he'd always joked about that there'd be other you know, kids running around. And so when it, I turned up in the paper and I looked like his eldest son, um, we, through the help of Kate and doing DNA testing, because records were just impossible to, to get your hands on, um, we've been connected for a year and uh, we see a lot of each other and I see his sons and it's been a really positive thing to have that contact. Um, yeah, I'm still negotiating with my folks. They haven't, my folks haven't met him. That's the final hurdle, I think. And they're still quite reluctant, but ultimately I think they realize it's been very positive for me and therefore, you know, they're very supportive of it. But I, that'll happen soon, I think. And then it'll, you know, then it's all, a, about being in the open, isn't it, really? I'm going to be really brief because I'm so glad I was left to last because I'm feeling an absolute p gaping paucity of substance. No, we, want, we, wanted a newbie. we wanted a newbie on the panel. When I heard Roger get up, I listened and I thought, I got nothing. <laughs> um, 
basically, and but when I hear Kelly's story, and sorry, Michael. Michael's story, I'm I'm really sort of a bit choked up. Um, I came to this. I was an an 18 year old university student sitting at lunch at Queen's College, and one of my friends came back with a pamphlet, and it looked like something that was more interesting than waiting tables for seven dollars an hour. They were offering $30 for a donation, so we all rocked down to Prince Henry's Hospital. This was 1985, and we were given the sad news that you actually had to qualify. So you had to give a sample, and then they looked at your sperm count, and uh, only if you're in the top 20% of sperm count did you get selected. So out of the eight of us, only two of us got picked, and so it became a badge of honour for us. So we were quite open about it, what we used to do for a part-time job. Um, and if I'd sort of fast forward through that, you know, the, to me, I've always been fairly open about, you know, uh, you know, when the question comes up amongst friends, what's the most interesting thing you've ever done? Well, guess what? I used to be a sperm donor. And so I've always talked about and been fairly open. And I've always thought, I, I read a poem that, um, was up there before from the exhibition that you had. And I, I feel like that as a donor. I, you know, over the years, I've looked at people and I've thought, gee, you know, he looks a bit like me. Maybe, I don't know, could be my child. Um, so then I saw the ABC Australian Story. Was that, was that the one you were on? Oh, OK. I saw a strange story about a, a donor conceived person. And I felt quite emotional and I thought, Gee, if there's someone out there, you know, who's searching for their origins, you know, they should have access to that information. So, as someone who's just entered this system, um, I don't have any of the sort of uh, worries about it. I just want the information to be available to someone who is in that boat and um, to, I guess, be open and available for them to ask all the questions they have to ask. And um, I guess I wouldn't be in a situation where I'd be saying, look, I need to know who the people are who, are, who have been born of my issue. Um, I'd just like to make sure that, you know, if they needed anything, information or support or anything like that, that I was there to provide that. When I was a donor, the, the prospect of, of actually linking up and meeting offspring was... was really a very, very faint possibility because it, it was anonymous. The, the hospital people kept saying this, although I, I was always interested and I, I, I had on the paperwork, I, I ticked the box that said, would you ever be prepared to meet your offspring? I, and I ticked the, the, the yes box. And all the time there was the possibility over the years that one day someone might come looking for you. And I always welcomed that moment but I know there are donors. I've, I've, I've been in touch with a lot of people in this community, and I, I, I know that there is heartache that they may never find their, 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 their offspring may never find their, their donors because of records being destroyed. But it is one, th one thing that uh, a, a lot of donors I know would love to know. They would love to meet their offspring if they come forward. And in, under Victorian law, of course, they now have the, the uh, opportunity to make application to meet their offspring. I think for us, the, the, what I would say, I suppose, is don't be too afraid. Um, that you have a lot of things in your head that you're anxious about. Um, but it has been an extremely positive experience for us, for many people I know, and obviously for everybody here. Um, I think it can be scary. Um, but I think the outcomes for many people, whether you're a parent or child or a donor, um, are good um, and not to be afraid of the possibilities um, because it might just be that the outcomes are actually extremely good because they can be and they have been for other people. So I suppose that's what I would say. My advice would be to, um, when you're making decisions about these things, particularly if you have small children, to put yourself in the, in the shoes of your children, because I find for me, and I know that our donor has been very respectful in this, in this way as well, these were decisions that we made for us at the time, but essentially we did it to them. And so I suppose I would say, think 
less about the impact that this has on you and more about the benefits that it can have for your child and act in your child's best interest, not necessarily your own. I'm the non-biological mother of our three and I think the one negative thing, the one very clunky thing for me was that one of the very early times that we met David, um, he was in the country, he came with his wife Sandra and their two kids um, who were slightly older than ours. And they all came to our house. I don't quite know what we were thinking at this stage. But anyway, we just said, yeah, 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 come, everybody, all together, it'll be fine. Um, and the first thing was that uh, David and Sandra's uh, son looked exactly like <coughs> Corin. Like they, you could see that they were half siblings and they went off to play in Corin's room and that was a bit freaky. Um, but the one thing that, that happened, we had, we had a lovely time and they, everybody got on really well and it was all good. And then they went off and it's kind of like as the door closed, I think I was putting the kettle on to make a cup of tea and I just burst into tears. Um, and I couldn't even kind of work out what it was. And then I realised that, um, that everybody in the room um, was related by biology and I wasn't. And I was the only person in the room who wasn't related to my kids. And that was really tough. Um, and uh, that took a little bit of processing. And I think that was the one thing I I in all of this that um, was difficult for me. One of the difficulties, and it hasn't really been a great difficulty for us, but it, it touches on um, Kelly's, uh, sorry, Fiona's presentation on the myths. Um, None of the donor can see families that I've linked with, nor the donor has ever really been concerned about the myths. But what's been interesting for us is the impact that people who sit around us on the periphery have had with the myths. So, you know, we went into it very open-eyed and very, um, you know, willing to take the journey as it comes. But it's quite interesting to see the people that sit kind of related to the donor and they're related to us as families who perpetuate these myths. Um, you know, f I suppose on the donor side, well, what if these children want to uh, just coming to run off with a family estate? And say on the donor conceived person side, you know, what if the donor falls in love with the kids and wants to have ongoing access or runs off with the kids? So the difficulty is n we've never had a difficulty in, in forging the relationships with, between us personally, but the difficulties are more just being batting off well-meaning people who do continue to pe perpetuate these myths. But I certainly now see myself differently and I actually see a lot of him in me and I see myself differently in the mirror. It's quite strange. I, I look differently to myself knowing him and his boys and finding out that his dad and his grandparents were singers and pianists and that's what I do professionally and it's something that's not in my family otherwise was very reassuring that I'm it actually is some, you know, it, it is okay that I'm doing that and it's not this weird thing that you know, it's, it actually came from somewhere. And I know that he's delighted because, yeah, his dad sing, sang and played by ear, which is how I play. I can't read music and nor could um, Norm. And it's like, oh, that's okay. Like, I'm not stupid that I can't read music. It's, it's genes. Blame it on so the donor. It's, yeah, but it's, it's, it's great comfort knowing that, you know, that there is a kind of order in it, that there is, you know, inherited things. And it's very comforting. Will you 
recognize when you find the resemblance out there in the world Do you ever wonder what I'm like? But it's not so simple 